This is Beyond with Heather Tesh, where we examine near-death experiences and life itself, hopefully making this life a little better. Hello, and thank you everyone who is joining us today. My guest, once again, is David Williamson. David, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks again for, for having me. <laughs> it's great. It's great to have you. Now, this is part two. So for those of you listening, if you haven't watched part one yet, please do that first. David has such a unique and fascinating near-death experience, so you don't want to miss that. But David, now I want to talk a little bit more about who you were before the near-death experience and how this changed you. Um, before, um, I was a, I mean, I, I'm not, I wasn't a horrible person. I wasn't a violent person, but my my ideation was very toxic. Um, I had I had um, all of the race narrative stuff. I was born in North Carolina in a small town. Um, I was born in Chapel Hill, but I was I was grew, I grew up in Yanceyville, North Carolina, um, Caswell County. Uh, I, I was told to this day is the like the highest active Ku Klux Klan in the country. You know. And um, as a child, I actually saw, I'm 46, and I, I've seen the Klan march down the main street of the town, you know, multiple times in my in my life my, as a child. And um, so a lot of just those experiences, those polarizing, you know, perspectives and experiences and seeing um, our responses to them, you know, our responses to them, it, it, it angered my family, it, it, it uh, hurt my family, and, and so I, it, I just... That's that's it bothered me the same way. I learned how I was supposed to feel about racism from seeing the effects of it on other people, and it's a real. It can it hurts. It, you know it hurts people, and and uh, I don't think we were. My family is I, I strong family, strong blood. So for us, it was more like um, the reaction was anger um, and rage. You know. Um, hate you want you want it, with the hate if, if hate is the game that we're playing then we're gonna we can hate you just as well as y'all can hate us you know and um and so I, I just went through life not really a, able to have good relationships with with white people even if they thought that we had a good relationship uh that was that narrative in my mind and it kept me from really being open and, and having being close even if I wasn't violent towards them or mean it to them at all, it still was a barrier for me. You know, the race was a barrier for me because um, uh, I just felt like black people were suffering here disproportionately. It hurt me. Um, I didn't, it didn't seem that there were times when I would see something happen, uh, you know, in the news or whatever. And then I would, then I'd be on Facebook or social media and I would see, every time the perspective would be polarized around racial lines. And it was like, are we really different? Are, are we, you know, are we, what I would see would be somebody got killed in a situation where they should have just went to jail and had a trial, no matter what happened, no matter what they were being arrested for, you know? And, and, and what I would hear from, you know, from a lot of the white people in my friends list would be strictly well, he shouldn't have did this, and that's why he died, and that's okay. You know, like, and I would be like, well, it was a traffic stop, <laughs> you know, or it was a stop for a, tra a blinker on a light. It was, you know, it was like, how how can you rationalize it escalating to someone losing their life? And it, so it, all of these interactions just, for me, it just kept polarizing my opinion because it was like, there has to be something different about us to see these this one incident and have these two totally polarized perspectives of what's happening. And that caught me up in that. Like I was so caught up in that and I was um, blaming racial narratives and blaming race for every shortcoming in my life instead of decisions or my anger, even perhaps my rage and anger and how I felt about the people that I was actually trying to, um, to work with, you know, or trying to uh, get, if I, if I had a desired outcome and there was a, a white man across the table from me when I was in my most angry and depressed state, I felt anger for them. I felt anger towards them. Even when I'm in a situation where perhaps it's a job interview or, or a promotion, you know, uh, discussions about a promotion, 
So it's like if the outcome doesn't come out the way that I want it to, perhaps it's not a race thing. Perhaps it's the anger, the, the energy that I'm bringing into the, the situation. That's kind of the stuff that the near-death experience, you know, made clear to me, you know, is that my personality killed me. When I first returned from the experience, I was, um, I was still, you know, I was deep, I was still depressed. And, um, but I, I'm beginning to think that was physiological and, and habit. It was just my habitual state way of being. And I just had to kind of had to run this course, you know, me, I had to decide that I wasn't going to be that way anymore, you know? And so it took me, um, three and a half years to kind of shake that depression. But I was also told after heart surgery that I was going to be depressed, which, and I didn't take any of it seriously because I've been depressed my whole life, you know? So, um, I was depressed and it was debilitating. I, I couldn't, I didn't, I didn't want to participate in this life at all. Um, I didn't like it. I, I never liked it. And that's why I died in the first place. <laughs> you know, it's not feeling like I was able to participate fully in this life. And I didn't really want to come back now and seeing it, seeing, having seen what I saw and, and, there was nothing attractive about the idea of participating in this anymore. So I think part of the depression was really wanting to go back where I was when I left my body. Um, but after I started sharing the near death experience, um, I started having more memories of it. Um, I started feeling more kind of like I felt, I started feeling the love that I felt there, you know? Um, and and I actually there was one day after the near death experience where I, I I I wanted to kind of go back so that I could feel that love. I wanted to go back to that space and um and I so I tried to like meditate and I and I left my body and um in a similar way as I was above myself in the hospital I was above myself but I was kind of I was here in my house and um I was looking down at myself and I was um thinking about David, you know, and how he has tried to to figure out this this stuff his whole life. Like, I, I have over 4,000 books. I started buying books on religion when I was, my mom started buying books on religion when I was five, six years old. Um, so I was familiar with a lot of different teachings after I, you know, came back to my experience, but nothing about near-death experiences really stuck <laughs> you know, so I was totally confused until I started sharing it and then being pointed to resources, jumping into Facebook groups and stuff like that, and um, really learning about uh, you know near death experiences and seeing the differences and uh, coming to understand mine and and all of that helped me ground what happened to me and, and integrate it, and that's when I think the the deeper understanding started kind of just flooding in, you know. Um, the stuff that the mistakes that I continue to make, like when I make them, they become immediate lessons for me. One thing I think is really interesting with you is you really analyze this and you also analyze yourself and you want to be a better person. And so many of us are like, well, this is who I am. I'm not going to change, take it or leave it. And it, it seems like what you're telling us is it's important to challenge and analyze ourselves continuously always and everything and everything you've been taught about this planet because um this place that we're at now with all this polarization and contention that's not where we started that's not where this planet started um even the wars that came came after the after a period of to me of that where i feel that there was peace we're not thinkers anymore this is has gotten to a point where war and and fiat currency dictates the value and the worth of a nation like you know military might and, and fiat currency and and these you know and it's ridiculous there's no values virtues or anything being centered anymore and we understood this in ancient greece in ancient egypt in ancient samaria in ancient india we understood that values and virtues were way more important than, the, than these artificial constructs that we've created in in place of this these real tangible orientations towards what being a human being is well and taking it to the individual level you said that you don't you try not to identify with a group 
But for a lot of people that have been marginalized, that have experienced the racism that you talk to, they feel very justified in the anger that they have. So what do you say to them? The nervous system, and these are things that I've learned because I'm trying to be a better person. Like the nervous system is designed, an emotion is supposed to be felt for 90 seconds. That's that's what some uh, neurologists say. And we feel, I felt hate, I felt anger, I rage for 30 plus years. And the only thing that I got from that was hypertension, um, heart surgery, um, digestive issues. I ended up losing my gallbladder. Um, bad relationships even, like compromised relationships because of my uh, um, overactive amygdala. <laughs> um, trauma because of the trauma. So when we're angry at others, we end up hurting ourselves. That's it. That's it. That's, and now, even if I look at the disparity that's in the black community, I can look at it as an opportunity to, to do something. I, it's work to do. Mm -hmm. And if I have work to do, not only can I monetize that work, um, I can do that work in ways that makes me wealthy. I can do that work in ways that makes me proud and happy. Uh, and I can center being proud and happy to, to, to fix things that, dis that affect people in ways that it shouldn't affect them. I can be proud of, of, um, of, um, of viewing quote unquote things that used to have me so angry and confused and dejected and not even wanting to participate in life anymore. I can be proud of looking at those things as opportunities now. I, I, hey, I can create a business around some of the disparities, some of the issues that disproportionately affect my community and fix it. You know, then I can go with this business, go pursue contracts from state, city, whatever, to do this in my community and other communities that need the same thing. Now I got contract after contract now and a business is flourishing and I'm doing well. Now I can teach somebody else how to do this in their community. You know, like there's so many opportunities that come with disparity. You know, and, and even with like I, I got so I try to, <laughs> I just try to look at at your personal like wherever you are, you can start fixing problems, because what what I did was you know I I became so angry that the only thing, I mean I didn't want to just violently randomly just kill people, but the thought of actually fighting to fix things or to make things right, I, I would have been very on board with some kind of fight to fix things and to make things right for everybody here, you know? And, but because they're, you know, most people are just about rhetoric and talk and, you know, there was never anything for me to really <laughs> attach my anger to in that way. So it just killed me, you know? Uh, I don't know. So, and I can talk to uh, most people. There's a lot of people who know me from when I was um, more activistic and angry and, and all of these other things. I'm not, saying that those things aren't necessary. It's important to to discuss disparity and fix it. But to just bring attention to disparity and never have solutions, that's that's what activism oftentimes have become in my eyes. And and it's it, it creates um a cynicism not only from the system itself, because they don't really address the issues. They can just say some throw a little bit of money here and say some uh, symbolic over substance stuff, <laughs> symbol over substance is all that we've ever gotten as it relates to begging and pleading and, and, and marching for equality. You have to get up and fix stuff. You know, the system, I, get, I don't know, the, the system has been working in such a way for so long that in order for it to work in so, a different way, it takes, it takes time. It takes, it, it, it takes, you have to do something different to get the system to do something different, you know? And I think that sometimes we continue doing the same stuff here and expect something different out of the system. And it doesn't make sense to me anymore. And, and, it, and at some point it's like my extreme vitriol for the system becomes elevator music. Now I got to do something <laughs> versus just sitting in that anger and doing nothing. You know what I'm saying? I, so for me, it's like I, the way that I talk to to people like that, because I've talked to people who've just gotten out of prison. I'm talking to people who are getting over um, drug addiction, um, people going through extreme and living through trauma and or who've lived through trauma. And 
it's the same stuff. An abused wife. Uh, my my friend Zach is a so was a soldier, a, tra- a soldier experiencing PTSD. Uh, it's the same stuff. Our nervous system is damaged. Our nervous system is messed up, and and we all, it's, we get overstimulated when 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 we are faced with issues. So, so we're not thinking, and and all of this emotional stuff becomes all that we seem to be able to process instead of just okay, there's a problem. How can I fix it? I'm not going to sit in anger anymore. That just, it doesn't make sense to me. And I wasn't able to rationalize anything in that anger. Well, I imagine when you were in space that you really saw a connectedness between all of us that you hadn't experienced here on earth. Yeah, that, that's it. I did. I felt one with everything. Not and just, everyone? Yeah. yeah everything and every. Like not just life, like but every piece of this experience, like it's the same thing to me. Like all of it is alive. All of it is is the same. All of it is the same. Um, that is something that I'm starting to feel so deeply that I can. I can understand people better because there's not a lot of ideas inside of me that I value that has distracted me from just simply understanding what's in front of me, what's happening in front of me. I'm not toiling over something always anymore. I don't have a a chore in my mind that always has to be, you know, centered. Um, so when somebody's in front of me, I can feel what they feel. I can, this that space that's usually occupied by so many other useless ideas inside of my mind is not being filled with useless ideas. So when somebody comes in front of me, it's filled with them. It's filled with the idea of them. It's filled with what they feel. It's filled with, and the interaction becomes, especially when I'm aware and I'm trying to be aware versus like um, in a mode, like at work, sometimes I'm going from one place to another and, and the interactions are kind of brief and you know, you know, however warm they can be in those brief moments, you know, I try to make them warm, but they're just brief. But in a moment where I'm just actually in front of somebody and there's an interaction, a really one-on-one interaction occurring, if I can remain aware that I'm, I'm aware and I'm attention, you know, I am attention. I'm not an ideology. I'm not an identity. I'm, I, attention seemed to be the, the best way to describe what I felt like I was when I was outside of my body, you know? Um, then there is no competing noise inside of me that keeps me from really, really taking in what's happening in front of me. And I'm not, my nervous system won't respond with a story that I've told myself for 30, 40 years because nothing is triggered. No part of my awareness is triggered because the the ideology isn't there anymore that makes up the story that triggers this part of my brain that says you can't go over there anymore because the boogeyman is over there. Like none of those things happening because it's not being triggered by an an additional idea, initial idea that triggers all this nervous system stuff. So being aware of my thoughts and being aware of the ideas that I allow to just exist inside of me, you know, keeps my body from having the same habitual responses to, to external triggers, you know, and I can observe that and, and, and I can enjoy the absence of those trigger of that triggered state. And the benefits of it is when there is external information for me to actually perceive, I have full bandwidth to perceive it versus having 75% of my bandwidth toiling over a bunch of ideological nonsense and and ideas that aren't even useful at all. So now it's like everything that I think and feel, I can literally, I can observe it and check it when it goes too far awry. Or in hindsight, I can say, I'll never do that again. David, you mentioned the amygdala a few times, and I believe that's where we process our emotions. Is that what you're referring to and how yeah. you react to that? Yeah. And this, and and it tells you, like, if you stub your toe as a child in the on in the corner over here in the in the living room, as a child, you might tell yourself that 
something bad is over in that corner and you might not want to go over there anymore. You know, the amygdala just tries to protect you. It tries to keep you from having the same bad experiences over and over and over. So it tells you a story that's, that doesn't really encapsulate what happened, but it, it, it exaggerates your reaction so that you won't let it happen again because it's potentially dangerous and the body is always going to try to protect itself. The brain is a part of the body. So the brain is going to tell the body stories <laughs> to keep it from hurting itself, you know? So even if it's just a stub toe, the memory can get distorted and it can become a boogeyman in the corner, you know, that you don't need to go over there anymore. And that's what happens with life is um, <clears throat> we, we get, we run in the walls, you know, over and over and over. And then we start telling ourselves a story about why we keep running in the walls versus taken into any kind of accountability for perhaps what we're doing, you know, prior to running into that same wall over and over and over. Like what decisions are we making that are recurring as well? Like it's, all, it's not always the outcome that you look at to come to some kind of conclusion about what's happening. It's about what led up to that <laughs> outcome. You know, is it the same, you know, steps that led to this outcome? Every single time, are you thinking the same way? Are you feeling the same way before the outcome happens every single time? Those are the, that's the part that I wasn't aware of um, prior to my near-death experience. I'm, I was intelligent enough to kind of understand the variables that were involved in, in me getting the outcome that I wanted. So I could kind of put some of the stuff in place to where I was like, okay, I should get this outcome. My resume looks good. Uh, you, know, you know, all these things are in place already. But then I would... I wasn't aware of go going into the situation really angry or really anxious about, you know, having run into the wall. These people are going to say no. They always say no. They, I'm, I'm black. They white. They racist. They're going to all, they're just not going to open the door. Like, I'm aware of that kind of thinking now. And it influences the outcome. It just does. It's the same way that a dog feels your anxiety and, and growls at you when you get close. If you were scared of the dog, the dog is scared of you because the way that the dog perceives it is that you can hurt me <laughs> because you're scared of me. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just energy. It's just anxious energy. It's a high, it's a threatening energy. Your fear is threatening to that animal, you know, and the same we perceive energy the same way. We're just not aware. Uh, we're not aware of it. We don't center that that type of knowing. So when people respond negatively to us, and we're like, "What happened? I don't understand." And we immediately deflect. What were you thinking about? Do you like that person? You know, do you not like that person? If you don't like that person, you can't be shocked that they were that they recalled from you, because you carry that I don't like them energy into that equation. And it's like sometimes people never take any accountability for their thoughts and the energy and their feelings towards a person when they go into that situation. And when a person responds in a way that's like kind of um, uh, it's surprising or not expected, they'll just say something's wrong with them, <laughs> you know? And that's what I did. It's something wrong with them. They're, they hate me or they're, they're this, but I'm not thinking about the fact that I actually hate them and I'm mad and I'm, you know, I'm this and I'm, I'm not really carrying any kind of peaceful or focused energy. Like w when you want something to happen a certain way, you focus your energy on and your attention on that outcome. You don't have, you don't carry all this trauma and nonsense into that same circumstance and think that that's not going to influence it, you know? So I carried my entire traumatized self into every situation thinking that my narratives and storytelling and trauma wasn't going to influence those outcomes, you know? So that's the awareness that I think now that that's new, that's, that's new for me. I'm never going to blame anybody for a negative outcome. If my energy wasn't balanced and my thoughts weren't clearly, I want to wear my thoughts. Well, and I think this is new to a lot of people. And for others, I think it's a good reminder because I think it is so true that we overreact sometimes because we are, thinking back to another situation subconsciously, not consciously, but subconsciously. If we like really truly thought about everything that we were feeling and thinking when we go into any encounter, especially if there's an encounter where you have a desired outcome, you know, um, you have to know that your thoughts about that person, your thoughts about yourself, your thoughts about the past, your emotional state, um, all of that, is going to influence the outcome. So if you can focus only on the outcomes that you want 
even feeling like you've already had that outcome. If you could focus on that feeling of already achieving, you know, what it is that your goal is, um, it increases the likelihood of it having, happening and it decreases the likelihood of your nervous system being triggered in such a way that it disallows that thing from happening. That it creates an, an internal obstacle or an internal um, orientation that just pushes the thing that you think that you want, that you do articulate that you want away from you because you filled yourself up with so much, you know, opposition, you know, oppositional thinking and opposing, you know, rhetoric that there's no room inside of you for the thing that you actually think you want. How often do you think about your near-death experience? Every day, every day, um, because uh, it's, um, it, I think I think about my whole life almost every day now because it all led me back to this place of um, of, of peace. And it's like, I, I don't feel like, um, before I felt like um, I, this life, I could have taken it or, le or left it. It wasn't, I didn't feel it in any way connected to it, you know, but after the, after processing and grounding and integrating that, the near death experience and seeing that it was me that led me in my life that led me back to me and just, and seeing the beauty of being a human being, you know, just simply being a human being. I didn't value that before. I didn't value, I was just miserable before, you know, and just being here with this, with new eyes and seeing everything differently is, um, it's just an opportunity. Every day is an opportunity now. And I see it that way. And it, even in the routine of a of a rat race kind of scenario, I'm still I'm excited. Every day is an opportunity. I talk to people in, in my workspace in ways I never did before. I um I enjoy being there. Um, I think every human being is beautiful, and I think just being around a bunch of people in a in that in that kind of way, it just presents opportunities to interface with God in a lot of different ways. You know, you know, and that's on the train at the job it's just opportunities to talk to myself outside of myself and it's just beautiful to me now like i love talking to people i humanize everybody even the person that is trying to be violent towards me i'm thinking about what made him feel this way like why is he so angry like a man tried to fight me at the train station and i was thinking the whole time even though i'm antagonizing and having fun not in any way no nervous system response i was thinking like he really is hurt. Like he's hurt, and it's and it's stunted his um, emotional development to the point where simply look me looking at him made him feel judged, and that made me feel bad because I felt that before. You know what I'm saying? So even though he's being violent towards me and he's he's potentially coming towards me to fight, I'm listening to what he's saying, and I'm saying, and I'm thinking like I felt everything he's felt before. I felt it all. And in this particular instance, I mean, he was cussing at me. He was going kind of crazy. But I eventually started telling him that I loved him. And I was still smiling. And, you know, and he may have taken it as me poking fun at him. But I was really just trying to change what was happening. And uh, I said, bro, I love you. I love you. And I was, you know, I'm laughing. And, and I'm saying, and he gets to the elevator and he's, and he's mad still cussing at me. But the elevator door closes. And then and he pushes the button again and it opens and it closes. I say, bro, you won't even get on the elevator. I said, you can't even leave. I said, you love me too. Just say it, bro. You love me too. <laughs> and and now when I see this man, he talks to me like that never happened. He, he said to me one day, because I would speak to him after that, I would speak to him every time, you know. And, and the very next day that I spoke, not the next day, it was like a week later, maybe he just forgot, I don't know. But I spoke to him, I said, hey. <laughs> I like that. And I was thinking maybe he was gonna be mad. He said, hey, unk. And he's older than me, but he said, hey, unk. He called me unk. <laughs> like, and I know that's just a normal, you know, that's normal kind of thing that we say, but we usually say that to people older than us. He said it to me and he's older than me. And it's very clear that he's older than me, you know? So he said, hey, unk. It's a respect thing. Exactly. So weeks later, I have passed and I've seen him several times and I speak to him every single time. So one day the train is about to leave me and I'm running down the steps and he's kind of just, you know, loitering around. And um, 
And I say, hey, bro, how you doing? And I keep running. And he's, and I hear him speaking. So I slow down and I look back. He said, you always speak to me, brother. You always speak to me, brother. I love you, brother. And I was like, there it is. <laughs> I knew you loved me. <laughs> That's wonderful. But I, I didn't say that. I just kept running to the train. I was like, yes. I, and I, you know, I said something like, I said, you could, you, you're my brother or something like that. And I just kept running. But those kinds of interactions with me, I just, they're just weird. Like, I, I, one day this man might be ready to fight me and the next day they're, you my brother, hey brother, you know, uh, unk or something. Well, I just, I think that shows what a great teacher you are. You're a great teacher to the people that you interact with and certainly a great teacher to all the people that are listening. David, I have so enjoyed talking to you. You think so deeply and you really analyze things and I just love that about you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you so much, David. I have so enjoyed our conversation and I wish you the very best in all that you do. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thanks for joining me on Beyond with Heather Tesh. Please add comments and questions you'd like future guests to answer. Also, if you liked what you heard, please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe. That'll help keep this podcast going. You can also go to Beyond with Heather Tesh to look for more episodes.